that we've got um, some interesting speakers and we've got some interesting participants. Now, um, what I'd like to do is um, ensure that we have a very um, interactive session. So the intention today is to run um, two presentations with question and answers um, at the end. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kanthi Ford and um, and I chair the international panel of the Pipeline Industries Guild. And this is um, one of our um, first um, webinars of this year. And I'm very hopeful that it will be um, the opportunity to um, relaunch the international pipeline. Um, international pan the international panel of the pipeline. So, um, Kate, would you mind just turning the next slide? So um, we see the international panel as a showcase, um, as the window to the opportunities for the pipeline industries across the world. As the world gets more global, we're actually quite a small community, whichever pipeline sector we work in. And, um, and everybody gets on and works very busily in their own silos but very rarely shares best practice and knowledge in a wider forum. And we're hoping as we progress to make that um, forum far more global and far more interactive. So today, um, as our first um, event, our first online event, we will have a face-to-face -face event in the UK in September. And then we will be looking at another international event with another part of the world in um, in um, early next year. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, three keynote speakers. Um, firstly, uh, John Zahari, who is president and CEO of Altex Energy. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about um, John Zahari in a moment. And then um, we've also got Cullen, um, who is, um, is a, who, who works as a, um, project leader, is that right, Cullen, um, for Wolf in Canada? Yeah, and then we've got Greg McIlvery, who, um, um, Greg, how are you positioning yourself with your, um, I know that you're a, um, a scenarios guru, and I'd, I'd love to know what your current um, uh, positioning is in the market in terms of your company um, organization name, please. Improving organizations through strategic conversation, Thank scenario you. planning, strategic planning, facilitated conversations, and most importantly, action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so John, John Zahari, um, I'd like to introduce you as our first keynote speaker. So you're president and CEO of Altex Energy. Um, your industry leader in rail terminal operations and managing logistics for moving Western Canadian undiluted heavy oil to markets around North America. So, um, so please do talk to us and give us a Canadian major pipeline infrastructure overview. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, can everyone hear me? I can I hear so. you loud and clear. Sounds great. So, uh, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to meet you all virtually and um, pleasure to have the opportunity that uh, Ella and Greg, or sorry, that Kathy and Greg extended to uh, to give you a little bit of overview on, on uh, the Canadian pipeline industry. So, um, and I've expanded it slightly to sort of Canadian infrastructure industry. I'm obviously gonna be relatively brief, so, um, but certainly happy to answer any questions. But just by way of general background before we start, um, Canada is uh, a big place. It doesn't have necessarily a huge population, about 35 million people, but the country is about 5,500 kilometers from, from east to west, uh, something similar from north to south. And so there's a lot of territory to cover there. There's a lot of territory to build infrastructure pipelines in. And uh, by way of scale, I just put, uh, a cutout of the uh, the UK beside uh, Canada there. So I think uh, did a little math and I think Canada is 40 times bigger than the UK roughly and about 180 times bigger than England. So um, 
it's uh, geographically a large place and you got to move stuff a long distance. Next slide. I uh, really kind of focused here on, uh, on uh, the pipelines, obviously, and in particular, I focused on pipelines moving uh, oil and gas. Uh, the oil and gas industry in Canada is predominantly in the western part of the country, sort of uh, indicated there by that oval, dotted oval on the, on the west side. And so that's the oil gas producing region. This particular slide, I'm gonna come back and talk about it, but this particular slide focuses on oil as well. So that's the main oil infrastructure that moves uh, oil out of Western Canada into the oil consuming regions. Uh, most of the people in North America live on the sort of Eastern side of the continent. And, um, and one of the attributes of how the development happened really across North America is, uh, is the um, given that the people live predominantly on the eastern side of the continent and a lot of the resource industries are located on the western side of the continent a lot of the infrastructure was built to move uh, those the resources from the eastern side of the continent to the western side of the continent so uh, but you know certainly resources are critical to canada um, and that is you know quite widely defined obviously oil gas agricultural products also uh, produced in its significant quantity in Western Canada, moved to Eastern Canada and globally, but predominantly to uh, Eastern North America. Next slide. One of, one of the advantages, uh, yeah, one of the, you know, advantages, I guess, of being a relatively small population, but living next to uh, a country which is the largest consuming, uh, largest economy in the world, largest consuming nation in the world. It's uh, certainly a great advantage to be able to feed the products that one that the country produces to that uh, to that neighboring country. It's an advantage, obviously. It's also a challenge because, as a small exporting nation, um, you do uh, you do become very beholden to your consuming partner. Um, by virtue of uh, of shipping that um, of needing to ship those resources, so the infrastructure has been uh, developed in order to feed those, uh, you know, Eastern U.S. predominantly, I guess, Eastern Canada as well. But uh, this particular map focuses in now on on crude oil, and on crude oil, um, Canada produces about five million barrels a day. Almost all of that is in Western Canada in that oval on the, uh, that uh, red oval on the, on the west side. It, uh, some does get exported into the US and then re-imported into Canada. But you can see there on the pipeline side, um, the, you know, most of it, most of the pipelines uh, that move that, you know, roughly 5 million barrels a day or about four to four and a half million barrels a day with local consumption in the in the producing area, are uh, focused on getting this uh, product moved to the U.S. Midwest, and um, there's a, a a few different pipeline systems. Um, one is one is the main line is is Enbridge uh, owned infrastructure. Trans Canada or what is now called TC Energy also has a pipeline called Keystone. Um, that feeds more or less the same area, um, extends it a bit further south. And then we have a state-owned pipeline, Trans Mountain, that feeds uh, the, the uh, refinery infrastructure consuming region on the west part, uh, Vancouver area on the, and the upper Midwest, um, oh, sorry, the upper uh, west side of the, of, of the U.S. that feeds oil into that consuming region as well. So this uh, next slide, the uh, this uh, this, uh, and I think I've hit most of these, but certainly, uh, you know, certain certainly one of the things that I'll come back and talk about it a little bit is looking for opportunities to diversify markets as well, um, recognizing uh, you know the advantage of proximity to world's largest consuming nation, world's largest economy, but, uh, but also recognize, and this has happened in other resource industries as well, also recognize that there is advantage to getting kind of more plugged into the global economy as well. 
Next slide. This, uh, these are all clipped out of various different places. So they're all, uh, they're the same continent, but uh, the maps are slightly uh, different in each one of these ones that I'll show you. But um, as well as producing a lot of oil in those, that Western part of the, um, of Canada, it also is a big natural gas producing region. Um, sort of the same oval there shown. These are the natural gas pipelines. Um, country produced about 16 BCF a day um, in that region, uh, exports about 70% of that. So about 30% is consumed locally. It has a larger consumption of natural gas th than oil because uh, a good chunk of, or not a good chunk, but a portion of the natural gas is actually consumed in order to uh, create steam to produce the oil. So the, um, so the gas is, is feeding not only uh, export markets or retail markets, industrial markets for consumption, it also feeds the oil industry itself that, uh, that consumes that natural gas. Uh, in order to create the steam, the steam is used to liberate the oil. Um, once again, major markets, U.S. Midwest, uh, Eastern Canada, uh, they're also there just heading down towards California on the uh, west side. You can see a, a pipeline infrastructure that moves natural gas into the states of Washington, Oregon, and, and down into California. Um, so this is, uh, this is the uh, kind of main way the gas, natural gas industry, production industry has been developed and the market has been created uh, in that idea of moving, uh, oil, uh, moving these resources more to global markets. If you look uh, kind of faint, uh, faint line there heading due west from the, uh, the red oval, you can see um, a pipeline which is under construction, which is uh, Coastal Gas Link, which would be the first significant LNG exporting uh, facility, which is under construction by Shell. And so that, uh, that facility, which has been talked about for about five decades, but uh, now is under construction. And, uh, and so that would start uh, the process of, of uh, uh, not insignificant, I guess, uh, LNG exports out of, out of this base into markets globally um, done off the West Coast of Canada. Major, pipe, major uh, pipeline owners here, uh, Trans TC Energy, uh, who historically is, is the major exporter, Enbridge also owns an export facility as well. So, uh, so those two pipeline companies, Enbridge and TC Energy, come up. Uh, for the major pipeline infrastructure, both on the oil side and on the natural gas side. Next slide. And I'll just skip to the next one as well. Just in uh, the spirit of, uh, the spirit of uh, uh, being fulsome, uh, recognizing this is pipeline industries guild, not the railway industries guild, but uh, the other, uh, significant infrastructure, or one of the other significant infrastructures that exists in the country historically and currently is the railway system. So this is a map of the, uh, the major rail lines in North America, um, of which in Canada there are two. Uh, the Canadian National Line, which is the one shown in red here, which goes from the West Coast to the East Coast and then to the South Coast of North America. And the second uh, Canadian line is CP or Canadian Pacific, which is shown sort of in uh, purple there. Um, in total, there are six. Canadian Pacific is also just in the throes of buying what's shown on this map as KCS or Kansas City Southern. Um, so there are six uh, rail lines, rail owners in North America, um, CN and Burlington sort of being the largest, but. Uh, but uh, an aggregate of, of uh, six of them um, move products from, uh, from the East Coast, the West Coast, the South Coast, all across the continent. You can see just sort of as how railways have developed, they predominantly get built where there's lots of people. So, uh, so most of the railway infrastructure is on the East side of the continent. 
but a lot of the railways were built in order to access resources uh, or territory on the western side of the continent. So they tend to be east-west running pipelines um, and um, with some north-south infrastructure as well. But uh, so this, the railway infrastructure moves, you know, really all resources, um, a lot of agricultural products, forestry, um, imported products, cars, you know, various other retail industrial products that get, get imported off onto the West Coast or East Coast, and then moved across the continent by all these different railways. Um, oil is also one of the products that is now moved. That is a relatively new, sort of over the last 10 years, that was reintroduced. One of the reasons that was reintroduced is that Canada produced a lot of heavy oil bitumen. But in order to move that product in the, the pipeline system, the, it has to be diluted. Um, so, it, um, the, you know, a lot of the oil that gets produced in Western Canada is maybe five API to uh, five API to twenty API, fifteen API. Um, that's sort of specific gravity, one point oh three to point nine seven or so. Uh, so in order to move that effectively, sort of using um, the, you know, the existing pipeline technology, that needs to be diluted with lighter hydrocarbon. A lot of that hydrocarbon is actually imported into Canada. So this is one of the, uh, you know, this is one of the, it's like selling butane lighters in uh, the Middle East, selling, uh, selling snow to the Inuit in Northern Canada. Uh, we actually import oil so we can export oil, but uh, that's the nature of trying. We import the lighter hydrocarbon in order to dilute the heavier hydrocarbon that gets moved to market. One of the advantages of using the rail system is that you can move that product without diluting it, so you don't have to import the product. But that's not the way conventionally the industry has worked. Next slide. I appreciate it. I'm going very quickly here, but uh, and I'll go to the next slide as well. So, so looking at pipeline infrastructure uh, in aggregate, there's you know significant. And this is just in the oil and gas side. There's 550,000 miles, almost a million kilometers, of oil of uh, oil and gas pipelines across the continent. It's a heavily regulated industry with uh, with a with a large emphasis on safety. This is uh, a significant part of really how the oil and gas industry runs generally and certainly how the pipe industry runs. Um, you know, there are and continue to be sort of ongoing challenges that, that everyone faces, but uh, one of the challenges for the pipeline industry is that we've had growing oil and gas production in Canada. So in order to move that to market, you obviously have to grow as well the, the, um, the egress options, the pipeline infrastructure to move that to market. Um, and so that's been predominantly on the oil side, but we've also had natural gas growth in recent years. We did have some decline in natural gas maybe 15 years ago, but that is now bouncing back again. Um, so certainly uh, ongoing infrastructure development is a significant uh, priority and it, it remains a challenge because Permitting is more complicated than it has ever been. It's been more difficult to get these projects built. Uh, we've had uh, delays in building some of this infrastructure. We've had capital cost overruns. And so that uh, remains a significant challenge. Um, not one that's insurmountable, obviously, but a challenge. The, uh, we also have some of these pipelines um, are you know, now five decades old, that kind of number. So we've got renewal of the system that needs to be done. That gets done on an ongoing basis, but um, but needs to be done just to make sure the system stays up to date. And then um, and then accessing global markets. So um, you know it's uh, you, you look around the world where oil demand is growing, um, natural gas demand is growing. Quite frankly, a lot of that tends to be in East Asia, South Asia, increasingly in Africa. And so if, uh, if the production is in um, North America, but demand isn't growing in North America the same uh, extent it was, how do we get the infrastructure built to get that access to those global expanding markets? So that, uh, and so in the interest of being 
brief here, Kathy. Uh, I only have one further slide, and that is uh, a bit of a kind of breakdown of of how uh, if you look around the world, is on oil. The bar on the the blue bar on the left of each one of these areas shows production, and the red bar on the on the uh, left or on the right side shows consumption. Uh, it is a little different, and, and on that one of those early slides, it actually shows production in Canada and consumption in Canada versus the U.S. This one is just aggregate by region, so you can see uh, which regions here are major um, importing regions: North America, South America, relatively balanced. Uh, Western Europe is now uh, predominantly an importing area. Uh, Asia is certainly a very significant importing area. The Middle East and um, and the former Soviet Union, Russia, are uh, exporting regions. So the challenge is, you know, how to connect up those regions with pipeline infrastructure being, uh, you, you know, critical. I guess in that uh, in that analysis, but you've also got global sea trade being important um, with this conflict in uh, Ukraine going on. Um, and, and it's, uh, you, you know, Western Europe looking at its situation today and its reliance upon feeding itself from, uh, from Russia and its interest in getting off that reliance. Um, you know, this is all gonna change, um, needs to change in order to feed those global markets. Um, and so you have a challenge both for consuming parts of the world as well as for producing parts of the world as to you know, how you get connected up. Part of that, and a relatively easy part of that, is the shipping part, because ships are relatively mobile, um, and uh, you can move the ships around. Probably the more challenging part of that is the pipeline part, mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to move a pipeline. And Kathy, with that, I'm gonna conclude and uh, hand back to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, and and it was like that was like throwing a, a metaphorical gauntlet down, wasn't it? This is the challenge um, for um, global um, markets. So um, I'm hoping that um, everybody that's listening tonight um, or this morning will uh, put some questions in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'd like to now move on to Cullen. So Cullen's held numerous key projects. Um, project positions in the North American industry and is currently charged with managing the broad project activities for Wolf CO2 assets, including the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, ACTL, and its associated injection and compression infrastructure. Um, Cullen also oversees Wolf's development of greenfield interconnecting pipeline opportunities while helping facilitate growth initiative on the ACTL system. So I'm going to hand over to you, Colin, and I'd be really interested to hear your presentation now. Yeah, thank you uh, for that introduction, Kathy. And um, I may uh, have to ask the host of the meeting to enable screen sharing so that I can share my deck with you. At this point, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay, perfect. We are rolling here. So I'll just look for a thumbs up from everybody if you can see uh, the perfect. screen. That's perfect. Thank okay. you very much, Colin. Great. Um, just before I get going to clarify here, we can see the the actual full screen presentation. Um, we're not looking at a PowerPoint or my my Tetris high score, correct? No, we can see the very full good. screen. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. So. Um, Really, really great to be uh, with you all today here. Um, obviously, you can you can start to I think see the passion um, you know of of the speakers here with uh, with all the great information that John just said, just shared. And I think I'll do my best to carry on that passion. You know, um, you know the, the pragmatic approach I think of of the energy industry and and key players um, as this evolves over the next 10, 20 years and what we're seeing unfold before our eyes. Uh, to keep to keep the wheels turning, so to speak, um, with important initiatives that are you know enable 
the continued uh, production and usage and responsible um, deployment of our energy resources kind of transitions and leads us into what I'm going to be talking about today a little bit, which is the Alberta carbon trunk line system. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the system, um, basically, it's an idea that's been around since 2010. Um, it's only been operational, however, for a couple of years. Between that time period of 2010 to 2020, there was um, a number of, of things happening as the project was getting up and rolling, and I'll speak to that a little bit later. Uh, because it is, it is a multi-proponent uh, project across the value chain, uh, a lot of collaboration with, with our Canadian uh, federal government, with our Alberta provincial government, and then again, looking at the integration of the system, we've got um, you know, participants on the capture side, we've got participants being wolf on the conditioning, compression and transportation side, and then we have participants on the downstream side, which ultimately leads to the permanent sequestration and storage of the CO2 and gener generation of carbon credits. Before I get into that a little bit more, though, I'm just going to touch briefly on who we are at Wolf. Um, well, Wolf is a rail, relatively new company, um, especially compared to some of our peers. Um, it was it was sort of founded by a, a management team that had had a, a series of successful records um, set in the in the private equity space. Uh, the team was responsible for a company called Taylor Gas Liquids taking that public, um, was responsible for a, a significant pipeline that was built connecting an ethane supply in North Dakota and actually importing that, uh, that ethane into Alberta's petrochemical system as a feedstock uh, through 2020, 2012 and 2015. Um, and then basically led to this iteration where um, I think CPP Investments, which is our national pension fund, which has something like $550 billion under management. I think they recognized that they were underweight in the Western Canadian midstream space. And this management team that I'm speaking of sort of had just, um, you know, become free and was looking for the next thing to do and, and Wolf was born. Um, so our mandate here at Wolf as a portfolio company of CPP is to, uh, I think, help put some of those surplus funds that aren't needed for direct uh, pension um, distributions to uh, aging Canadians to help take those funds and put them to work and, and grow them over time so that, um, you know, me and my, my children, my children's children and everybody else's can, can uh, continue to benefit from, from the pension structure. Uh, so since 2016, we've set up basically uh, three individual businesses. Um, the first business, which I'm going to be talking about today, is our carbon business, where we have the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, moving about 4,400 tons every day of, of CO2, very pure CO2, um, CO2 that would otherwise be emitted to the atmosphere. We also have a significant uh, heavy oil asset called the Access Pipeline System. You heard John talk about the dilution that's needed to move this heavy oil. So our system uh, sort of takes care of that by moving um, a diluent product up into the, the source of the heavy oil, diluting it, mixing it up, and then creating a, a viscosity that is, that is able to flow through the pipeline, um, the Access Pipeline System. And then we have the NGL business, which is actually our newest business unit where we're constructing a green, greenfield NGL recovery and separation infrastructure. Um, and unique to that system is, is sort of by, and I won't get into this too much, but by um, taking the, the liquid hydrocarbons out of a natural gas stream. It's actually leading to a, a leaner stream that's being combusted in the oil sands, and, uh, and the overall carbon footprint of that stream is actually reduced by virtue of this NGL business. Um, myself, I sit within the carbon business, and basically, as Kenty, Kenty mentioned here, I'm really focused on not only operating the ACTL system, keeping the lights on, but looking at ways that it can grow to its fullest potential. And as I'll mention in a few slides here, we, we have some excess capacity that was part of the original design and the original thesis of the pipeline so that we can, we can bring this system to you know, benefit not just the original participants in the project, but future uh, groups that are looking at abatement initiatives. Uh, with a little bit of certainty today. So ACTL, um, this, this slide is is a you know a little bit old, but it it still actually remains uh, true that it is Alberta's key new CO two infrastructure solution. And as we're kind of turning uh, into a transitionary period where things like CCUS and um, hydrogen hub, carbon sequestration hub, these these terms become um, you know almost almost uh, sexy in our, in our industry that it's it's sort of a bit of a Yukon gold rush in our neck neck of the woods. 
uh, meaning that everybody in the industry seems to try to be find a way to participate this not only because there's opportunity here but um, we find that having a let's say a co2 abatement story or some other esg story creates opportunities with debt financing with insurance uh, opportunities at, at favorable rates that may not be available if you just participate in the traditional sense um, so we see a lot of activity growing around the industrial region that this pipeline services um, we entered the project as a sort of a late um, participant here uh, you know one of the things that we think that we can do really well is is come up with creative ways to finance things uh, because our as i mentioned our shareholder is it's a private uh, fund it's 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 certainly you know not short on capital it doesn't mean that the hurdles are any low, lower with deploying that capital but it does mean that we can um, take you know different approaches than than some of our peers who who may have we'll say quarterly uh quarterly items that they need to focus on and that's exactly what what we did here um we, we came up with a financing structure that that enabled basically at the time, you know, a, a relatively um, worthless commodity, CO2, um, unless there's a policy behind it or you can generate an oil response or maybe you can store it in soap. It's a lot of soap at 4,400 tons per day, but it, it, it didn't have value. So it was difficult to monetize that. And of course, in the last couple of years, we've seen such a such a change when it comes to that with carbon policy, with our federal government and the trajectory of carbon pricing. Um, no doubt that's one of the drivers that's creating a lot of interest in this space. Um, but we sort of saw, see ourselves as, as a early bloomers, um, you know, when, when it comes to the system because we built it uh, without, the, without the benefit of that knowledge and found a way to make it work. So what does it do? Um, right now, it takes two different sources from third party CO2 supply. These are industrial sources, so they're anthropogenic or man made CO2. Um, and on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. One source is about 4,000 tons per day, the other source is 400 to 800 tons per day, but totaling about uh, 1.6 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, we've deployed about 35,000 horsepower of of compression of energy into the system to get this CO2 in a pure transportable state. And then we, we move that into a high pressure 240 kilometer pipeline. Um, when I say high pressure, I'm talking about 18 MPA, which is, which is significant and presents some challenges, again, that I'll talk about a little bit later on, on the technical side when it comes to um, CO2 specifically, like, you know, basically all stresses associated with pipeline and um, inside the pipe wall itself, things like rapid decompression and ductile fracture arrestation. And then at this point in time with the system, what we do is we actually move the CO2 to a third party who's also on the value chain where they take custody of the CO2 and use it for enhanced oil recovery and generate credits. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with enhanced oil recovery and how CO2 works in that system, um, the best analogy I can draw is it's, it's a solvent. So you get a little bit of grease on your, on your hands, you need a solvent to get it off. It's the exact same idea when CO2 uh, mixes with with trapped hydrocarbons forms a miscible substance and allows it to flow as a mixture through the reservoir to surface where it's recovered. The CO2 is separated. Uh, the hydrocarbons are, are you know, sent to market after a bit more processing. And then the CO2 is re-injected underground. Um, through this process, there's a permanent storage effect because not every pore pathway uh, that the CO2 is trying to wiggle through in the reservoir leads to the surface, kind of like a cul-de-sac, a dead end, where the CO2 just eventually becomes sequestered. So the net effect um, inside the closed loop system is all the, all the fresh CO2 coming down the pipeline, as well as the recycle stream, all end up underground and they stay there. The system, as I mentioned, though, it was, it was early, I think, in the, in the context of um, some of the new policy initiatives that have come out in Canada, some of the, the economic drivers that we think are there that are unlocking this great potential. And so, you know, when this was concocted at the end of the 2010s um, with, with the different proponents, um, one of the key drivers or key unlockers at that point in time was a collaboration with government entities who I think also saw the benefit of the system, the scale and the impact that this could have um, through the future. So, so that's where this um, collaborative effort came. Um, obviously, these things 
with government entities when funding is involved take a lot of time. There needs to be a public benefit uh, long term. And so, um, and there is not just by virtue of the system itself, but by virtue of all the knowledge sharing that is deployed with the system um, annually. We are, we are required to assemble all of our learnings from the previous year, along with the other proponents being uh, Nutrien, Northwest, and Enhanced Energy, compile a report and, and share that with, um, with the provincial government, and then that gets released to the public. So hopefully a lot of um, you know, learnings that make the next iteration of this cheaper and more efficient and uh, quicker to, to develop and deploy. Um, but basically from tip to tail, um, looking at the source, the carbon capture, the embedded components within uh, the Northwest Sturgeon Refinery, which was operational uh, starting in 2020, within the Nutrien facility, which has been operating for 50 years, and then within Wolf's uh, infrastructure and Enhanced Energy's infrastructure, all told the capital Capital outlay was uh, approaching a billion dollars. Um, large portion of that was was funded both on the capital side, but there is there is also um, you know a finite but but significant operating grant um, as as I say this carbon price starts to ramp up and something like this can be uh, self sufficient and standing on its own two feet. But the point that I'm really trying to to emphasize here um, I think is that with this collaborative effort um, with this overbuilt system uh, for the future and, and working together with uh, our government partners, um, it's, it's making a big difference. So in, in a little over two years of operation, we've sequestered and um, abated two and a half million tons of, of CO2. So that, that to us is uh, something that I think is meaningful and, um, and uh, it's pretty easy to get up in the morning and go to work when, when you know that what you're working on has this kind of effect. Um, because this is a pipeline uh, guild presentation, um, I did, I couldn't resist, I'm an engineer by background, um, but I couldn't resist sharing some of the, the unique considerations that went in to developing this pipe. Um, you may have heard me touch on previously, just overall, overall induced stresses with the high operating pressure, um, the ductal fracture, arrestation. Um, so, so one of the things that's really unique with CO2 systems, especially in a pure state at high pressure, so liquid dense phase, is that they have a propensity to tear themselves apart, the pipeline that is, if there is a breach in the pressure containment wall. What I mean by that is, if we were to see a rupture in the system without appropriate consideration, uh, CO2 pipelines um, can tear themselves apart along their long axis. And this is called ductal fracture. And it can be sustained for, for kilometers and kilometers until this crack tip that is, that is running along the pipe uh, runs into something like a defect in a weld or a heavier piece of pipe or something. So we have to take great, um, great interest and great care to design the pipe to ensure that if there is a breach in the pipe wall, that it doesn't do this. And that's what you see these pictures of right here actually is, is the project conducted a full scale burst test where a pipe wall was compromised um, and pressured up with CO2. And then the results were analyzed to ensure that, you know, this thing doesn't just keep ripping itself apart, that it self arrests. So in this cluster of pictures here on the top right, you see this, this wavy looking thing. That's it's actually a pipe wall that has been ruptured and split apart and it's lying flat, almost like you're peeling open. I don't actually have a good analogy for this, a banana, I don't know, something like that. Um, it's a sine wave inside the pipe wall and that's how the ductal fracture moves along. So um, with our very pure CO2 mixture, very dry stuff, very high pressure, um, this testing allowed us to to come up with a specification for the pipe that ensures that this does not happen. Um, the other thing that I think is, is notable with CO2, uh, for anybody who's interested, is, is that it, it also um, is nasty stuff when it comes to soft goods. So your sealing elements in some of your equipment or your valves, if you don't specify that properly, you, it can lead to a situation which is called explosive decompression. The CO2 molecule, it impregnates the, the, um, the soft structure of the elastomer. And when it depressurizes, it sort of wants to get out as fast as it can and it can shred it, it rips itself apart. And that's what you see in the bottom left picture there. Um, that is a, a, an actual uh, seal that was compromised be, through this process. Um, and then last, lastly here, just in the bottom right hand picture, I, I've, uh, I've got a sample of the ACTL pipe itself in my office. I've, I included a pen just inside the screen for reference, but you know, we are, we are 14.3 millimeters thick on a 16 inch pipe. 
with very strong steel. And one of the keys to it is getting very, very tough stuff, stuff that wants to resist this, this breaking if it happens. So, um, you know, we, we do hear a lot in the industry about repurposing old natural gas pipelines to run CO2. And there are ways that you can do that. But we also recognize that there's a huge safety consideration and, um, you know, some, not to throw shade on anybody, but we have heard some, some statements be made that are a bit reckless and without doing the homework and understanding what you're up against, it can be something that, that um, you know, might cause more harm than good if people uh, adopt that idea too broadly without understanding the implications and what needs to be done to make sure that this type of stuff doesn't happen. And so our ACTL system being that it, it is a ground up design is designed with this in mind and consideration um, and, and is, is a, a robust design that ensures uh, things like ductal fracture or explosive decompression um, don't occur. Um, in terms of the, the impact of the ACTL system. So this, this graphic here, I find really helpful because it sort of shows the proximity um, within Alberta. Uh, so you can see that in the in the bubble there, the province of Alberta in blue, you can see the, the location of the ACTL pipeline in proximity to some emission sources, as well as uh, current and future EOR, enhanced oil recovery or sequestration sites. So in Alberta, you know, we're very, very lucky um, to have an extensive sedimentary basement that provides excellent geology for long-term storage. Um, that part of that sedimentary basement, um, you know, at one point contained decaying organic matter, which matter which became oil, which is which is pulled out of the ground and has been for for many decades. And so that also provides, um, by by way of sort of fluid replacement in the rock, that also provides another excellent storage location for CO2. And so ACTL, uh, when I talk to, spoke earlier about the long term vision of the government and the original proponents, it was. It was designed and, and situated in the province to ensure that there's more, more capacity on the pipe for the future so that these emission sources can actually participate in the project and, and um, you know, uh, find ways to, to complete their emission abatement goals. So when we look at the future here, um, we see lots of interest from the emission sources. We know where those are located. You know, there's not huge new industrial emission sources popping up all over the place. We know where they're at. And then when we look at the subsurface geology, um, very, you know, few places in the world have been studied to the extent that Alberta has when it comes to subsurface geology. So we have a lot of opportunity here into the future to create a, an interconnected web of, of different emission sources and different um, storage solutions, which help to de-risk some of the capital constraints or risk constraints that come with growing the system. Um, if you have if you have one you know source or one sink that something goes wrong with, we can provide interconnectivity to other systems. That's that's really really powerful um, for for the type of capital that we're talking about when it comes to um, carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, and then and then when it comes to um, overall surplus capacity, what we also can provide with this system is a you know an, an immediate solution not something that's hypothetical five, 10 years in the future, but something that different proponents for their own projects can rely on today as a, as a storage solution to get out of an industrial center and head towards, towards uh, sequestration or EOR solutions. So we see this system as being you know, really, really important for internet interconnectivity in the future, not just with Wolf, honestly, but other proponents, other, other groups that are trying to develop their own uh, carbon dioxide infrastructure and, and storage solutions. And so when I talk about EOR and sequestration um, opportunities, um, in the last couple of months, uh, the well, actually in the last couple of years, the, uh, the Alberta government has been holding a process to allocate some of this subsurface geology, this pore space to different proponents to develop. Um, and in, 20, in, in March of 2022, we were successful in securing what, what we believe to be um, a high quality space in full capacity so that we can start to develop more of these solutions off of the ACTL. And we are one of six proponents that was, that was offered this space. And so now as we focus on the future and growing ACTL, we're also looking at, at um, creating opportunities for different emitters to store their CO2. Perhaps they, they don't want to go to EOR. Well, 
this this hub that we're calling it that we're developing has the potential to sequester up to six million tons per year for 30 years. So there's a lot of room in this for um, industrial facilities, whether they're new or or existing or or proposed. Um, so uh, again, just looking to the future with ACTL um, as the you know something that we've built, we operate, we own but something that's really there for Albertans and Albertan companies that are, are in close proximity to utilize um, to meet their ESG objectives long-term. So with this hub that I'm, we're talking about before I wrap up here, um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we are on track for first injection by the end of 2024. And, uh, and then like John, that's where I'll conclude with this um, hopefully cool looking drone picture of our facility. This is our, our physical facility. And in the background, you can, I won't point it out, but you can see uh, many industrial components in the heartland. You can see the new Northwest Sturgeon Refinery, which is uh, one of our sources. Um, this, this particular facility handles our uh, nutrient fertilizer byproduct as a product of, uh, byproduct of hydrogen generation. And then in the background as well, Wolf does have additional lands that we're developing as part of our platform growth initiative. And i um, not sure when this was taken, but uh, no rain in this picture here today. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you so much, Cullen and John. That's been really interesting. Greg, you would like to add a few more words, wouldn't you? I'd be pleased to. Uh, it's great presentations. Uh, great to connect with the folks at the Pipeline Industries Guild. I like the way you've brought together the, all of the industries that are associated with the pipeline business and all of the different flavors of pipelines from uh, energy pipelines, water, and other types of pipelines. So it's, a, it's an efficient way to move commodities from uh, A to B. So I'd just like to do a real quick screen share here. And I uh, wanted to make this a little bit more relevant to you. We have a, a think tank called the Canada West Foundation, uh, covers our four, uh, focuses on our four Western provinces. Uh, but they've just issued this report here in April. I'd be happy to share it in the chat. Uh, it's a, really about Canada's infrastructure problem. And all of you are in the infrastructure business. And uh, we've had a major decline in both public confidence in infrastructure, but also global confidence in infrastructure. This is the World Economic Forum's rankings. And you can see, you know, we may not have been ranked all that high, but it's certainly declining. The really frightening statistics are that we've dropped from number 10 in the world in terms of how we're assessed on export infrastructure to number 32. Unlike uh, many countries, I think the uh, OECD average is about 56% uh, dependent on exports. We're up more like two thirds dependent on exports. Apparently the US, when they dropped from 10 to 12 on this ranking, caused Joe Biden all sorts of headaches in the last little while because of this uh, uh, in the White House, because of this two level drop, we've dropped 25 levels. Why this might matter to you is with the rising kinds of complexity that we're seeing in the type of infrastructure projects, uh, we've got a lot of complexity in hand. We have public and private ownership. We have competitive businesses and regulated businesses. We're looking at this transition to a low carbon future. Uh, Canada, by the way, is pursuing net zero by 2050. And uh, we have our power industry, which has a lot of pipeline associated assets nearby. Uh, you could argue that uh, power lines, transmission lines are a form of pipeline. Uh, they're, they're planning to be net zero in Canada by 2035 and blazing that trail. We also have the rising nimbyism that we all face. People just don't want anything new built. And of course, we've got the issues around aging infrastructure. Uh, this might be a best practice that you might wanna think about in terms of a seven point plan to solve a common problem that anyone in the infrastructure business might have. Basically defining our key networks and getting shared understanding around those networks Bring all sectors together, develop criteria to guide the planning in terms of what infrastructure gets built first. You know, at one time, monopoly regulation took care of that. You got a monopoly, you're expected to uh, uh, build infrastructure 
in exchange for a return on the capital you employed plus your cash costs. That world's changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Now there, uh, you know, when you were monot when you became a monopoly, you got a franchise. So it was very simple. You had no duplication. Clearly, that's not the world as we've introduced more competitive models uh, to do pipelines. Uh, the idea of having an evergreening list of uh, infrastructure projects uh, within a common uh, uh, purpose area, if you will, a common flavor of infrastructure projects, whether that's energy, water, or others, taking regular assessments, and then actually informing uh, the decisions to move forward. Uh, and that would involve industry, obviously, uh, regulated and unregulated, as well as governments need to help clear the stage, regulators, and even the public. So that's a seven point plan to move this complexity forward. And uh, we've got some ideas on how we can do that as well that we'll be sharing with Canada West. The report was just issued, I, I think it was at the end of April. So it's still pretty fresh. It's excellent. Thank you very much, Greg. If, um, if you could stop sharing now, that'd be great. Um, so um, I have some questions. Um, and I just wondered if um, any of our delegates have got any other questions um, for our for our speakers. Adam, I see you've put your camera on. It's always a yeah. good clue that you're about to say something or ask something. So um, yeah, what would you like to ask? Well, very interesting. Um, and uh, thank you all for putting the time and effort. Um, it's also an exciting country. You know, I'm, I'm privileged enough to lead a team that has several projects up there. Um, but Colin, you actually started answering all the questions I was thinking of um, because the topic of here around the world at the moment is repurposing pipelines um, and probably even a, uh, even a more complicated specification uh, conversation is around hydrogen and, and um, you know, the, the, not, not just the blends, but when you get to pure hydrogen. And, and I was interested about that research you, you'd sort of done in those little um, pictures you'd shown and, and 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 was that sponsored by the government to do some sort of in effect destructive testing to prove out the, the you know what you had to do for the design uh, just a little bit more color on that would be great because it is a concern i know around the world as everybody keeps um trying to have this energy transition about whether it's going to be new build pipelines and what specifications or repurposing and or mixing yeah, no, a great question. And I think, um, you know, to, to start off and make that clear, the, the idea of reusing and repurposing pipelines is fantastic. There's no, you know, that that idea, the genesis of it is great. Um, where we have spent a lot of time thinking about is once we get over the, you know, the euphoria of that idea is more, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make it work? Is it, is it something that is feasible? In my mind, where, where my head goes right away is, well, there's a reason this line has been retired in the first place. And perhaps that's a supply demand thing, which, which I, I would say is great because um, that means it's probably not an integrity thing. But as we wiggle through all of those kind of ideas, which, which just kind of, kind of noise, um, wh what it comes down to is, um, is your steel fit for purpose. And there are certainly ways in, in my view that we can, we can make it work, but we need to have real realistic expectations as to things like the pressure that the pipeline can operate at and therefore how much um, impact can it have. And once we get down to that level, is it still the right call to try to um, you know, force this round peg into a square hole or is it a better call to uh, potentially utilize some of the same lands, the same right away um, so that we're not creating a new linear disturbance, uh, but putting in something that is fit for purpose. And so the point I was just trying to illustrate there, um, you know, is that we, we try to be very mindful of, of how we think about those things. We, we try not to be reckless with some of the statements that we release about whether this can or can't be done until we've, we've done the background work. And that's what you see in those pictures there. Um, so, so Adam, to answer your second question, if that was a sort of a government sponsored initiative, it wasn't prescriptive. It wasn't something that the government directly said, you need to go do this. 
Um, but it was something that at, given the level, I think, of interest and sophistication with CO2 uh, pipeline specifications of the day, it was, it was pragmatic to take a look at this um, with real world data, with real world rupture and burst tests in order to inform the design of this significant system. Um, that would be really, really critical for the province. Um, with that being said, uh, through the actual design, construction, and, and operations process, I mentioned there were um, there were grants made available by the government. Each one of those grants carried with it a certain uh, progress milestone, and so it wasn't a blank check. It wasn't here's X number of dollars, uh, have fun. It was if you reach this prescriptive milestone that demonstrates tangible progress in the project. Um, you, you know, we'll find that we'll find some of that funding. And so in the design phase, there were some some grants made available that certainly would have been spent on this study. Um, but it, it wasn't prescriptive. It was it was the design team saying, hey, we need to take a look at this. We need to understand it. And we need to make sure that what we're building does what we say it's going to do. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Martin Wayland, um, I sense that you're about to uh, to ask a question too. To whom are you asking a question, and what is it you would like to ask? You're on, you're on mute. That's better. The, the joys of uh, trying to do this on an iPhone, I'm afraid. Is that better? That's super. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this afternoon's presentation. I've been really interesting. Um, I did have one, sorry, I'm Martin Wayne, and I'm a principal inspector, I'm a pipeline specialist with the HSE in, in Great Britain. Um, I did have one question, it's regarding, uh, were there any lessons learned in Canada? I know this is in the States, the incident in so I always have trouble pronouncing, is it sat satire, or I'm, I'm never too convinced on the, on the pronunciation of that, back in 2020. I know there's been an investigation report done by the American regulator, I just wondered if they'd but there's any lessons learned that you guys have picked up in Canada from that particular incident? Um, who'd like to go on that question? I, well, well, I am familiar with the incident. I don't know if if Greg or John want to want to take it. I could I could offer a little bit of insight, maybe just to start the conversation. Um, the I, I think that what FIMSA discovered is the root cause of the failure. Um, Martin was was predominantly attributed to uh, a lot of rain in the area and, and sort of a geoslope movement effect that caused the shearing of the pipe. Um, from the pictures that I did see of the area, it, it appeared to me that the pipe itself um, did not tear itself apart, which would be the worst case fear in the CO2. So that I think that's a real positive. I think there were also uh, potentially just looking at some of the cross sections of the weld itself. I think that there was you know, some questions around not necessarily defects, but around, you know, complete weld fusion. Um, so when I when I think about some of the potentials there, which of course are our best guess and speculative, and what does the evidence suggest? And, and what we take away from that um, with our program, we do have a geotechnical monitoring program. So any areas where we have slope instability um, or evidence of slope movement, uh, whether that's in clinometers in the soil or whether it's all sort of topographical using LIDAR to, to predict how these things are moving. Um, hopefully we've caught most of those on the design installation phase and done a deep directional drill there. Um, one of the major rivers that we crossed were about 50 meters below the basin of the river, so well below the 100 year flood level. So we feel mm -hmm. comfortable and confident, but we still take, you know, go to great lengths to, to analyze the right of way where the, we're within, you know, a, a heavily um, agricultural area. So we do have landowners that are our best inspectors out there. If there's a problem, we'll know about it right away. Um, but we do see that, and then, and then even preemptively, we you know we've expect, inspected 100% of the welds on the pipeline, not only with a hydro test, of course, so a pre-service pressure test, but full in, full NDE and on critical welds, we do a post 48 delay on the actual uh, NDE itself. So we we try to we try to go I think above and beyond what maybe some of the base minimums would be, just to make sure that that uh, again we, we're, we're interested in keeping the product in the pipe. Um, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit, but I don't know, John, I, I know that you went off mute there. Maybe you, you'd want to add to that. Yeah, sorry, Colin, I didn't actually catch which pipeline we were talking about there. Uh, what Martin's talking about is the Satarsha um, rupture down in the States where there okay. was like a, a CO2 um, leak from a, 
a fairly significant full bore rupture. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything particular to add. So, okay. Yeah, def like, definitely made thanks for that, guys. Can I just ask um, one last question, which is, um, you know, what collaboration opportunities do you see, um, do you see potentially between uh, um, the Pipeline Industries Guild and what's happening in Canada at the moment? Can you see some opportunities for some of our members? I, I had a, I'll answer a question with a question as if the focus of the Guild is on best practices, what areas of best practice is the guild interested in. Uh, Canada, while it may not be known as one of the leading reputations in environmental management, as it develops energy uh, and water infrastructure, power infrastructure as well. Uh, that obviously is the result of some best practices in infrastructure development. Uh, it'd be great to hear also from the members or the people in attending what, what the area, I, I think that would define an area of collaboration Kathy, okay, is to okay. say what flavors of best practice and vice versa. Best practice is always uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. So you start putting ideas together. We've done something here. Someone else has done something somewhere in Europe or Africa or Asia. And you start to uh, make things better. Adam, perhaps you'd like to share a little bit about what you're up to. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's, um, it's well said, uh, Greg. I mean, I think that Globally, I mean, many of the pipeline contractors, uh, um, pipeline construction contractors, operate either you know overall globally or, or very strong in in quite broad regions. And I think John, your your you know your first slide is sort of showing in some respects kind of it is so big. It, it, you know, for, for a lot of us in in Europe, it, you know, it's bigger than the rest of Europe. Um, and there are going to be best practices we need to share. And the guild is has been. Um, you know, uh, it may be at the forefront of an industry which started, you know, coming ashore from the North Sea, you know, many decades ago. And, and there are a lot of my ex, personally, ex-colleagues who work on pipelines in the UK currently, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in Canada and, and some obviously, you know, emigrated there permanently, et cetera. But, but where we are facing it probably in the UK uh, is this beginning of this, maybe the, the, the Maybe may not the beginning, maybe the wrong word, but the the real problem of, of, of the governments um, laying out what 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 they like as an industry for us to transition, um, particularly towards the, you know the, the, the hydrogen economy, but at the same time actually not having a, a database of best practice or or specifications or um, those type of you know reference parts. And I, I know we have in the guild. There's an other panels, not just um uh companies led international panels what we're on now but you know for energy transition and and, and etc and, and, and across the whole the whole spectrum you mentioned water obviously you know we know that many industries are carbon intensive and we're going to have to decarbonize many industries and um, our guild obviously represents uh, you know a huge sway for that in the uk so i agree i think we'd like to keep um you know, trying to share best practice, uh, try to keep closer, um, you know, with uh, updates on projects and ideas uh, and, and sharing, sharing that. Um, and I know, I don't, I'm trying to look at some of the names on, but I know certainly, obviously, our president of the, the, the Pipeline Industries Guild at the moment, you know, represents um, John Murphy and Son, you know, which is, you know, again, a, a global player who's, who's obviously got interest in Canada as well. But it, so it, it, it is, to me, though, a challenge as our industry comes out of the COVID times uh, and the real difficulties around the world and moving people across borders, that we're going to be faced also with increased pipelines. And you mentioned Ukraine at the beginning, etc. So we, 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 we know that there is a, a going to be a global demand for pipelines. But again, as Colin says, you, you know, some we're just going to make sure people aren't making cavalier statements that, right, they are fine, you can recommission that. A pipeline which was decommissioned for probably very important reasons, uh, which means probably shouldn't it should be thought of very carefully first. We know there's going to be supply constraints in, in things like valves and fittings and uh, um, compressors um, and all of that. So it's a it's a great time to be joining our industry, but it's also a, a challenging time ahead of us all. And 
sharing as a very small community, as, as you really said mm. at the beginning, you know, globally. And, and this is um, great to have you all on and trying to get in the right time zone. And I'm sure we can build um, some more events and maybe hopefully some face-to-face -face events to either tag on to some of your Canadian uh, exhibitions, etc. But uh, So I, I would see the Guild more as trying to share information, point members, allow yourselves um, also to get access if, if we do have some best practice. I think at this moment in time, Canada is still known around the world as the most mechanised and efficient way of building uh, pipelines. Um, you know, so there's a uh, many parts of the world who, as we know, we'll, we'll have 2,000 people as opposed to, you know, 20 people and a lot of very professional equipment. So keep sharing the best practice for the rest of the world and um, thank you for, for this evening's um, uh, presentation. Thank you, Adam. Yes, so um, um, John, um, Colin or Greg, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, John here, you know, I, I, Kenty, I would, uh, you know, sort of uh, like to highlight add a couple of things that uh, I think might be an opportunity for Pipeline Industries Guild or for companies in the UK. Certainly, the Canadian industry globalized a lot about a decade ago. It was quite a localized industry in many ways. I'm an engineer by background as well. And with my background in, uh, in this industry, you know, it was uh, sort of tucked away in the center of North America. We didn't need a lot of uh, external help uh, for, you know, for quite some time. And, uh, but as the industry expanded quite significantly in say a decade ago or just before, you know, you did have a lot of Asian European uh, engineers, uh, construction companies sort of come to, to assist in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that some of that is actually seeded. Um, so some of those companies have kind of pulled out as capital investment has gone down, but uh, I still see this as a global world and, and, uh, and there's an opportunity for global expertise. If, if I look at one specific thing, you know, Canada is still, you know, just with a low population, a big geography is still a fairly low touch uh, kind of environment, but that's changing as well. And, uh, and so one of the things that I do think that we need to learn more about, um, and I just saw a very interesting presentation on Crossrail, uh, the Elizabeth line sort of, uh, all the complexities of building something that had been talked about for two centuries, you know, right through a, a very populated city. Um, that's the kind of thing that increasingly, you know, is going to be happening as well. So those complexities of doing infrastructure development in a more densely populated environment um, is certainly something that, you know, is increasingly going to be a focus. Um, and, uh, it's not going to be just blasting it through, you know, lightly populated farmland like we, you know, did five decades ago. Um, this is a changing world as well, and and that no doubt will open some opportunity for expertise from people that have been doing infrastructure development in more populated areas. Thank you, John. Cullen, have you got any last words? You know, I I think that was really really well put, and I I think. The touch points is a really interesting part of the conversation that John brings up because we, you know, we we do see um, the interest and the emphasis on not only the environmental impact of of the industry that that we all work in in Canada, but as far as new growth and existing operations, there's there's the S part in the ESG story. So there's the social side, and so that as a as a key touch point as we're thinking about and and I'm I'm sure you folks in the UK have seen lots of lots of attention in the media on, on the coastal gas link project, on the Trans Mountain project, on, on the um, well, different groups that have opposition to the project, um, despite what we might suggest are, are uh, benefits to Canada as a whole. And so I think when we are, are thinking about touch points and sharing information on the technical side, you know, to, to carry on the positive messaging of our industry, there is also that, that part where, you know, the sensitivity towards the different groups and their different views and finding a way to bridge our differences to get to the point of, um, we'll say, betterment for all is, is becoming such an important part of, of projects right from the ground up with early consultation um, with, um, 
you know, accommodation, you know, with, with working through uh, the different viewpoints on things. And, and I, I do believe that there are opportunities. We're seeing it right now and ways to, to work together. Um, but that's one of the most, I think, important touch points that, that Canadian energy develop is going to continue to uh, need to work through is, is on the social side um, with the different groups that are involved and even public support for our critical infrastructure. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be writing up this um, session and we'll be putting your contact details, if we may, and uh, let's see what we can do in terms of dialogue. Before we go, I'd like to introduce Kate Lazenby, who is our CEO, to talk about some of our future events. But I would emphasize that um, our um, international panel is really looking to fill that empty showcase window that I showed you at the beginning. So please do come to me and please do come up with some suggestions of some of the things that you'd like to share in terms of best practice and let's build on this because it can't it can only start from now so thank you all very much Kate over to you thank you Canthy and thank you very much to John Cullen and Greg for this evening or this morning um, it's been really insightful and and I'm very keen that um, messages that sort of Adam sort of touched on with regards to energy transition and all the other sort of branches and panels that we have in the UK um, ultimately, the Guild is, is about sharing best practice and knowledge across the pipeline industry, regardless of sector. Um, and ultimately, I think we are in that great position where, you know, you guys have, have sort of talked about Canada, and I'm very keen that with, with Canthis sort of support in developing the international panel, that um, ideas and best practice can be shared right across the world. So really exciting times, I think, both for the industry and both certainly for, for Canthi and the international panel. So thank you very much. Um, we have got a few sort of events that are, are taking place, um, predominantly obviously in the UK, um, but really um, for, for me and just sort of to sign off to today is, is checking out our web page. So I know Canthi and, and the international panel are looking um, closely at sort of trying to arrange a face-to-face. -face. Um, and as Adam sort of talked about as well, we have a multiple branches and panels that uh, hold technical technical events and social bits and pieces as well. Um, so ultimately for, for me, it's checking out our, our events page on our, our web page which is uh, www.pipeguild.com um, and that will have all the latest information for all the upcoming events that we we are due to host so uh, really really appreciate your your insights today guys thank you very much for your time yes thank you all very much as john and cullen and greg i really appreciate the time that you've given us today so thank you all very much <laughs>